Have you ever been desperate? Never. Never for some of you. Fantastic. You can leave then. All right. We'll just talk to the rest of us. That's great. Listen, uh, all of us have been desperate at one point, haven't we? Uh, have you ever been desperate for God to move? Uh, where where it's, it's like if he doesn't do something, I mean, you're just ready for him to move in your life. Uh, that's the story that we're going to look at today. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and flip open to John chapter 5. We're going through the entire book of John together, and uh, we're, we're going to do it in three series. Today is the last day of It's a Wonderful Life, and, and then next week we start This Is Your Life. You remember the old TV show, This Is Your Life? They would highlight uh, a particular person. They'd go back and look at their life. That starts next week, and, and so we're going to uh, be doing that series, and then we'll have It's a Hard Knock Life as it gets a little closer to Easter time. And so we're going through the book of John together, and we're going to look today at this story of Jesus. It's a fantastic story, and I'm super excited about what the Lord is going to teach us through it today. And so if you got your Bibles, we're going to start with verse 1, uh, but let me pray to start us out. Heavenly Father, I thank you that, that you're with us today. You said that wherever there are people gathered together in your name, that you'd be in the midst of them. And so God, I thank you that your Spirit... Your Holy Spirit is here. God, as we open up these words uh, of this book, God, I pray that they would leap from the pages onto our hearts. God, let us see what it is that you want to teach us. Every person is going to be a little bit different today. And so, Lord, I pray your Spirit would move. Lord, I pray that every distraction would be banished away from this place. We would just focus in and worshiping you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, I talked to you about being desperate. Uh, my family went through that. Uh, when I was a little kid, uh, before I started kindergarten, I, I don't remember exactly what age I was, but uh, I, I was having trouble walking. And uh, I would be able to walk, and then all of a sudden I'd just fall down. I couldn't walk. My legs wouldn't work. And, and they really didn't know what was wrong with me. I remember they took me to different doctors all around Charlotte. I grew up in Charlotte. Took me to doctors all over there. N nobody could figure out what was going on. I, I had use of my legs one minute, and then the next minute I, I couldn't stand up. And, and um, I remember they, they took me to Chapel Hill and did some stuff with me at Chapel Hill, UNC Chapel Hill, go Tar Heels, and, and uh, bad year, rebuilding, rebuilding. And uh, that's right. Hey, and so uh, that's right. It's, so anyway, I, I remember all of that, and uh, there were just no answers from the doctors. It was really sort of a hopeless situation. And I remember being in my grandparents' house, Mama Duck and Papa Duck, uh, and I would lay down on their couch, and they would bring hot water bottles. You remember the old time, it like the rubber hot water bottles? They would bring those, and they would put them up underneath my legs, and you know. And I remember people coming to pray for me. There was a an old elderly lady in our church. She was a poet. And she had this unbelievable relationship with the Lord. Her name was Mae Varney. And I remember they, they took me to see her. And she laid hands on me. And she prayed over me that the Lord would heal me. And uh, I had an Uncle Doris. I know, I know what you're thinking. Uncle Doris. That, but but that's, that's a whole other story. And, but he came and he was a pastor. And he prayed over me. They laid hands. We had a prayer room at our church. A, a little room where, you know, the response cards you fill out with prayer requests. People would do that. And people could come in at any point during the week. And they would just look at those prayer requests and pray. And I remember people did that. And, um, and one day it was there. And then the next day it was gone. God just moves. Never come back. And God healed. Uh, but I remember in that place... You know, I'm sure for my parents, uh, they were desperate for the Lord to move. Have you, have you ever been there? Maybe not with physical things. Maybe, maybe it's you're desperate for God to move in your marriage, right? Man, God, if you don't do something, if you don't fix this, if you don't fix him, if you don't fix her, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. It, it's going to be over. Maybe, maybe you've been desperate with a kid. Right? Maybe for those of you parents, you're desperate. Lord, if you don't, if you don't do something, I, I may be in jail by morning, right? Uh, because I'm going to kill this kid. I mean, there, there's just no way. I'm not going to be able to endure them any longer. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's something at work. Lord, if you don't move in my situation at work, God, I just don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe, maybe it's your finances. Lord, if you don't move supernaturally, if you don't move, I just don't know what's going to happen. And you're at this place where you're just begging God to move. That was this guy. That was his story. And so I want you to find yourself in his story today. John, and we're going to look at chapter 5, starting in verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which had five roof colonnades. And in these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. This, this is a, a, a picture uh, of the pool of Bethesda. This is an artist's rendering of what it looked like. 
Uh, it was there inside of the Sheep Gate, and, and it was this five-walled pool. And they, the archaeologists found this, and uh, they've, they've done some digging out, and they've been able to find that this was an actual place, this was an actual deal. There was an upper pool and a lower pool. It, this pool was spring-fed, and so the water would come into the upper pool, and uh, some accounts that I've read say it was up to 13 meters deep in the upper pool. And then it had that fifth wall right there, the, the one dividing the middle wall, uh, that was a dam. And so the, the water would sweep down into uh, the lower pool and they had steps to walk in at the other side. And so uh, people would go there to this pool of Bethesda. It was called the pool of mercy. That's, that's how it translates. It's, it's the pool of mercy. And so people would go there, people that were lame, people that were blind, people that were paralyzed. Now, I, I, I want you to put uh, yourself in these people's shoes. Uh, they didn't have modern medicine. They didn't have the stuff that we have today. In, in that culture, if you were paralyzed, if you were lame, if you were blind, uh, you couldn't have a job like you could have today. You, you didn't have the Americans with disabilities that were, you, you could have handicap accessible stuff. You didn't have wheelchairs. Uh, you were completely dependent on somebody else for everything. You were completely dependent on someone else for food, for income, uh, to be able to take you anywhere that you wanted to go. There weren't, there weren't any other modes of transportation. People had to carry you. And so I want you to imagine this group of people laid out underneath the porches there. Uh, if you notice in, in your Bible, here, here's what it says. It skips from verse 3 to verse 5. Uh, verse 4 is in some of the older manuscripts. It explains why these people are there. And so what happened was there was a supernatural move of God at some points. We don't know when it would happen. We don't know if it was on a schedule. We don't know if it was just that the Lord moved with compassion over all these people that were there. And somehow, sometimes, in some ways, he just released this angel. But what would happen is the angel would stir the pool. It would start to look like a whirlpool in the lower pool. And then the first person that got into the pool, they were healed no matter what their disease no matter what their sickness, no matter what it was. Now, I, I, I want you to think about this. In these, there was this multitude of people. Uh, can you imagine the hopelessness of that situation? I mean, they're there every single day begging God, God, you have got to move in my situation. If you don't move, nothing's going to happen. If you don't move, I'm never going to be healed. If you don't move, I'll never be able to have this family. If you don't move, I'll never be able to get rid of this blindness. God, if you don't move, I'm doomed, right? And then God would move and the angel would stir the water. But only one person, only the quickest, only they were the only one who got the healing. Can you imagine what that must have been like? What if you were everybody else that was there? I, I, I want you to put yourself in... These people's shoes. I mean, think about it if it was your kid who was sick and you knew that there was an ability there that at some point, at some point, maybe it, it may be next month, it may be next year, but at some point the Lord was going to move and there was going to be something supernatural that happens and the first person who gets in there, they're the ones who's going to get it. Listen to this guy. How long he had been there? Verse 5. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Now I want you to imagine, for 38 years he struggled. We don't know what his infirmity was. But could you imagine going day after day? Maybe his parents started out carrying him there when he was little. Can you imagine day after day, somebody had to sit with him there and their eyes are just fixed. We've got to wait for the water to move. And when it moves, son, you be ready. We're going to get you in there. The very first person in, they're going to be the one that's healed. It was only the first person. Now, now listen, I, I've seen how people act on the day after Thanksgiving sales. Right? I've seen them act crazy ways for 10 iPads. You know, there's only like 10 of them in the store. It's a, there's 10 iPads at this price. There's 10 TVs at this price. And they're, they're willing to like mow down pregnant women. They're just like, Back, get out of the way. You know, I got to get my Blu-ray. Right? You know, or whatever it is. And they're just knocking people down. And you still have to pay for it. Right? Now, uh, th this was free. I, I want you to imagine if they were giving it away for free, what that scene would be like. It, it would almost be like this. What if, what if they said, we've got this amazing new drug. There's been this new amazing FDA research drug. And no matter what your ailment, it cures it. It's 100%. There are zero side effects. Every single person that has ever taken this drug, they've always been healed. No matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's cancer. It doesn't matter if it's AIDS. 
It doesn't matter if it's blindness, leprosy. I mean, it doesn't matter. Any of this stuff. They've taken that pill and they've been healed. And you know what? We're going to have that pill at some point in the next year. It's going to be at Lake Norman Hospital. And we're not going to charge anybody for it. Well, we don't know when it's coming. Uh, we just know you have to be there. And when it comes, the director of the hospital, they're going to hold it up in their hand. And whoever the first person is to take it out of his hand, they get it. Can you imagine the scene that that would be like? Can you imagine that? Oh, we've got people in our body, people that have cancer. I mean, we'd have the elders there. We'd be blocking people off. Where we'd be like mowing them down. We we'd be your tight end. You know, we would come out. We'd be blocking them. Out. No, you know, they're getting there. And we, uh, you'd run up. Can you imagine if it was your kid? And they were on their deathbed. This is the only hope. Can you imagine? What if you were there one day and then you missed it? Maybe it only happened once that month. And that was the day you decided to stay at home. What if you were there and you were like, I got to go get lunch. And you came back and you missed your chance. I mean, these people are begging God to move. Super God, if you don't move, nothing in my life is going to change. God, it's got to be you doing it. Can you imagine the selfishness that would have happened there? As one person sees it and they start to move and people are just elbowing their way because only one person gets it. This guy had been there for 38 years. Can you imagine what his friends must have thought every day as they're carrying him to lay down at the pool? I mean, man, you know what? Listen, maybe it's just not for you to be healed, buddy. I mean, every day we've carried you for 38 years. I, you're, we can't stay with you. Uh, we can't help you get down into the pool. we got to go. We'll bring you lunch later. But I mean, this is really a burden. We're carrying you every single day. But it was his only hope. Look at what happens. Jesus comes up on this scene. I love this. Here's what he says, verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? I love that question. I, I mean, it almost sounds like Jesus is talking smack to him, right? I mean, it's like, Hey, buddy, you want to be healed? Well, duh, Jesus, I'm here at the pool, right? I, I'm here. I've been here for 38 years. Of course I want to be healed, right? I mean, this guy, in his mind, he was thinking, of course I want to be healed, right? Write this down. He thought his location showed that he wanted to be healed. He thought his location proved that he wanted to be healed. He's saying, of course, Jesus, I'm here. I'm at the pool of healing. I'm at the pool of mercy. Of course, my location proves that I want to be healed, right? He says, um, I'm here, aren't I? That shows enough. Uh, how many of us do that? We think, oh, you know what? I'm here. I'm his church. That proves that I want God to heal my marriage. I'm here. I'm at the counselor's office. That proves that I want God to heal my marriage. I, I'm here. I'm at the bank. I'm talking to them about how to refinance. That proves I want God to heal my finances. My location proves that I want healing. But that wasn't what Jesus was after. Look what he says, verse 7. The sick man answered him, Sir, I've got nobody to put me into the pool when the water's stirred up. And while I'm going down, another steps in before me. He, he doesn't even answer Jesus' question. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? And he tells him why he can't be, right? Is that, well, you know, uh, yes, Jesus, I'd love to be healed. No, that's not what he says. Well, you know, no, I just come here every day, right? No, that's not what he says. He says, I, uh, listen, I can't get in. Every time I start to go in, somebody else cuts me off. Can, can you imagine how many times he's seen that in 38 years? How discouraged. This guy had to be battling depression. I mean, think about that. 38 years and you've seen person after person after person. And they've been healed. I wonder if he thought, man, I just wish my parents cared about me more. I wish they were here so they could help me. Man, I wish my friends loved me more. Man, I wish I, wish I knew other people that could stay and they could help me get in. But I got nobody to help. It, 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 here, here's what he said. My location should show you that I want to be healed, right? And then he said, my effort should show it. I mean, I'm here. Uh, I, I want to get in. I start to move. Whenever I see God moving, whenever I see him stir up the waters, I start to head towards the pool, but somebody else cuts me off. This, he thought his effort should show that he wanted God to do the supernatural. His effort, well, you know, I'm trying. We do that all the time, don't we? Oh, I'm trying to get better with my mouth. <laughs> I'm trying to get better with my anger, but man, it's tough. I'm trying to love my spouse more, but he just keeps leaving his dirty underwear on the floor. Pick it up. 
the box is right there. Put it in the dirty clothes. Golly. What, whatever it is, right? And, well, I'm, I'm trying. People think, well, my location, it should prove I want to be here. My effort, well, I'm trying. That's not what Jesus is after either. Look what he says. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, Get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Uh, this is a little minor to tell. That day was the Sabbath day. You know, you couldn't uh, carry somebody on the Sabbath. You could only go a certain distance. So maybe this guy had slept out all night long or they just broke the law. But they're there and he's thinking maybe today, maybe on this day, maybe on God's day, right? Maybe on Saturday, the Sabbath, maybe for us it'd be Sunday. Maybe on the Lord's day, maybe he's going to dole out a miracle. If I'm there, if I'm at the 1030 service, maybe if I raise my hand, right? Maybe I'm singing with all my heart. Maybe if I put a little in the play. Maybe God will supernaturally move in my finances or my marriage or my parenting or my health or my whatever it is, right? Yes, what he was thinking that day. But Jesus wasn't interested in his location. He wasn't interested in his effort. He just looks at him. He says, get up. Take it. Walk. Take your bed and walk. And the guy says, okay. And he does. Can you imagine? 38 years of suffering. God. Can you imagine what that's like? 38 years. Some of you, you've been in a marriage five, ten years. You've been praying, God, move supernaturally. You've got to fix it. You've got to, God, I'm hanging in there, but I'm hanging by a thread. God, you've got to move. You've got to do something. What if, in just an instant, he said, pick up your marriage and walk. Man, what would that be like? What a relief. You've been praying for that kid who's straying, right? You know, they've gone off to college. They're just sort of going off the deep end and, God moves supernaturally and then just they call you with a phone call. Mom, I just realized what a dork I've been. I, I, I'm going back to church now. I really am I'm committed in my faith. Right? That moment, can you imagine the sense of relief? You, you go to the doctor and you see the scan and where there used to be cancer, there's not any. And they say, we've got no earthly explanation for this. This is a miracle. And you say, God did it. Can you imagine the sense of relief? That's where this guy is. I love it. Look what he says. Now, wouldn't you think everybody would be excited for him? Wouldn't you think everybody would be so pumped? He's been waiting for 38 years for God to move in this supernatural way. And God does it. And now, what's people's first reaction? I love it. Look what he says. Verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to take up your bed. And he answered, The man who healed me, that man told me, Take up your bed and walk. I love it. They're like, hey, I know you've been here for 38 years, but you're breaking the law, right? I mean, you, you, you shouldn't be walking on the Sabbath. You, you only get a certain number of steps. You should have used those steps to go to the temple instead of taking your mat. You're not supposed to carry anything with you. I mean, if you're going to have the indecency of being healed on the Sabbath, which was against the law too, because that was work, then you're going to pick up your mat and you're going to walk with it? I mean, that's double offense. What's your problem? You must be a real sinner, right? How was their reaction to this guy? He says, well, hey, the guy who healed me, uh, you should take it up with him. Because he told me to get up and walk, and I did. And so he had that ability to move supernaturally, and nobody else has. I've been waiting 38 years for this. Look what he says, verse 12. And they asked him, who's the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed didn't know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. I love that. Can you, can you imagine? For 38 years you've been waiting, right? You get your moment. And then boom, you don't even know who he is. You just kind of, oh, where'd he go? Hello? He just disappeared off in the crowd. Thanks, whoever you are. Right? That was this guy. He didn't care. He was just like, woo, I'm healed. Praise God. I'm ready to go. Give me my mat. Right? He didn't even know who it was. Look at verse 14. I love this. He doesn't know who Jesus is, but Jesus knows who he is. He doesn't seek after Jesus. He's good just to go on his merry way, right? He's good to go home. He's good to go and find his friends and say, look at what this happened to me. Look at this. This is amazing. He doesn't go seeking after Jesus, but Jesus comes seeking after him. Look what he says. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you're well. Sin no more, so that nothing worse may happen to you. 
the man went away and told the Jews it was Jesus who had healed him. And we can just skip over this verse and it sounds like a really cool story. But the whole heart, the whole meaning, the whole purpose of this passage being in the Word of God is, is this one verse. It's verse 14. If you just skip over it, you totally miss it. Here's this guy. He's well. He's been waiting on God to do the supernatural for 38 years. And he thinks, well, you know, my location, that should prove it, right? I'm there. I'm at the place of healing. I'm at church. I'm in the counselor's office. I'm at the doctor's office. I'm at the gym. I'm ready for my body to be healed. Whatever it is, right? He's there. His location. He thought maybe his effort would do it. You know, my faithfulness. If I just show up, if I keep praying this prayer over and over, if I just keep waiting and watching on God, if I keep, my effort will prove that I want to be healed. And Jesus says, no. That's not what proves you want to be healed. And look at what he says. He says, you're well now. Go and sin no more. So that nothing worse may happen to you. Uh, look, look right here. This guy, his sickness was tied to his sin. Now that's not the same for all of us. Right? Not every time you get a cold is because you did something wrong. Uh, I mean, we have human bodies. Uh, the Bible says that we're fallen people. That, that death was spread to all of us because of Adam and Eve's sin. So because of their sin, we have sickness, right? You can blame Adam and Eve. But there are specific times that the Bible says certain sins, certain things that we do, God can put sickness as a consequence. And it didn't happen for everybody. You remember the man who was born blind? The, the Pharisees come up to Jesus. They're trying to trap him. Well, oh, well, Jesus, this man was born blind. Whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his sin or was it his parents' sin? And Jesus says, no, that's not why he's blind at all. For him, the reason he was born blind was so that God would have a chance to be glorified through his story. I mean, not all sickness is tied to that. But this guy, it was. For 38 years, he had been content to say, I'm going to prove that I want healing by my location. I'm going to be at the pool every day. For 38 years, I'm going to prove that I want supernatural moves of God in my life because of my effort. That's what it's going to be. But he had been content to hang on to the sin that was making him sick at the same exact time. For 38 years, he had been waiting on God to move. Look right here. For 38 years, he had been waiting on God to do the supernatural. He had been waiting on God to move. And he thought his location would do it. He thought his effort would do it. And Jesus looks at him and he says, No! That's not what I want. I don't care about your location. I don't care about your effort. Here's what I want. I want your repentance. And this whole time, he had been waiting on God to move. God looks at him and says, I've been waiting on you to repent. Can you imagine this guy? For 38 years... He had this sickness that he didn't need. Can you imagine as that sunk into his head? Even for 38 years, the burden that I've been to my family. For 38 years, the burden that I've been to my friends. Because I cared more about keeping my sin and doing it, but then I'm still going to seek God and ask Him to move anyway. I, I'm going to hold on to my sin and still keep doing it, but I'm going to ask God to move. I'm still going to come. I'm still going to come to the place of healing. I'm going to seek God. I'm still going to show Him effort that I care, but I'm just not going to care enough to let go of my sin so that He can do it. You see? This guy cared more about his sin than he did about his healing. Jesus looks at him and He says, it's not about your location. It's not about your effort. It's about your repentance. That's really the proof that you want me to supernaturally move in your life. Uh, this guy, for 38 years, what would have happened if he repented the first day? Think about that. This guy, his sickness was tied to his sin. For 38 years, he had been there every day seeking God. God, you've got to move. God, I'm here. I'm praying. I'm asking. God, I'm here. I'm faithful. I'm showing you my location. I'm showing you my effort. And Jesus looks back at him and he says... The entire time, look right here. The entire time you spent seeking me was totally wasted. It was totally wasted. You wasted 38 years of effort. You wasted 38 years of location. Because you never got what it was really all about. Listen, what it was really all about was you taking your sin and saying, I repent of it. I surrender it to you. That's what it was all about. All this time you've been waiting on me to act supernaturally. And I've been waiting on you to give up your sin. Wow. Do you think that ever happens for us? Do you think that ever happens for you? God, you've got to move in my marriage. 
God, you got to move in my relationship. God, you got to move in my finances. you got to do it or it's not going to happen. And God says, I'm more than capable of moving. I'm more than capable of healing. I'm more than capable of doing this. I'm more than capable of restoring. But the whole time you're seeking me with your location, the whole time you're seeking me with your effort, I'm waiting on you to repent. Your repentance is the key that unlocks the door to me moving supernaturally. Now, now don't get me wrong. Look, look right here. Not every person will be healed. You know, there were lots of other people at the pool that day. And Jesus didn't heal them all. But for that guy, it was his day. It was his time. God wanted to show him something that he could only learn through his healing that he couldn't have learned through his sickness. Those other people, they were there. God wanted to show them something through their sickness they could have never learned through their healing, right? Here's what Jesus said. I, I just wrote down two different areas. Maybe you just want to write these down. I just want you to think through these things because the ramifications of this are so huge. There's, there's times where we're saying, God, move! And he's saying, you, repent. Right? I, I, I wrote down two areas. There, there, here, here's... Here's both of them. You ready? Number one. Number one. <coughs> Number one. Uh, waiting on God to do the supernatural rather than repenting in your relationships. Let, let, let me read off some of these and see if this might sound familiar, right? Relationships with other people. God, you've got to save this person. They're so lost. They're headed down this horrible road. God, you, you've got to step in. You've got to open their eyes to salvation. And he looks at you and he says, well, have you repented of not following my command to share the gospel? To go into the world to make disciples of all people? Have you shared your faith with them? It might be like this. God, you've got to move in my marriage. You've got to do it. And he says, well, listen, I'm more than capable of moving in your marriage and making it better. But you don't love your wife like Christ loved the church. You need to repent of that. You care more about yourself. You're selfish. God, you've got to move in my marriage. You've got to change my husband's heart. He treats me so horribly. It's, this is the most miserable marriage I've ever been in. Right? And God looks down at you and he says, I can change your husband's heart like that. But you're still holding on to your disrespectfulness towards him. You only respect him whenever he's worthy of respect. I, I said that you should respect your husband even when he's not worthy of respect. That can be the greatest witness there is. What, what about this one? God, you've got to fix our fighting between me and our kids. You've got to fix our fighting between me and my spouse. And God looks at you and he says, well, you've got to repent of letting unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Right? God, you got to fix my anger. It's this anger problem. If you don't move, something's going to happen. God, if you don't do it, it's never going to work. Right? And I'm here. I'm praying. I'm here. I'm trying. My effort is going. But Lord, you've got to move. And he looks at you and he says, well, you need to repent of, uh, you, you need to be angry and not sin. You're, you're being controlled by something other than the Holy Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And if I'm controlling you, that's just part of your life. Right? You're being controlled by your anger. That means that's God and not me. You need to repent of that. God, you've got to fix our relationship. And he says, well, you've got to repent of holding that grudge. You've got to forgive. He says, God, I, I feel like I'm lost. I feel like I don't have any purpose in life. I know you as my Savior, but our relationship just doesn't seem like it's going anywhere. I just feel like I'm stuck. And God looks at you and he says, well, what do you expect? You need to repent. I've given you spiritual gifts. I've given you talents. But all you do is come and just consume. I mean, it's all about you being entertained. It's all about you getting a word from me. It's all about you worshiping. It. It's never about you serving anybody else. You're not using your gifts. Of course you're going to feel... Like you don't have a sense of purpose. You need to repent of that. Right? What, what about this? God, uh, my kids. I can't take my relationship with my kids. Uh, they just won't listen. They just won't obey. They just won't do this. And God says, you need to repent for not using the rod of correction. I'm just saying. Right? That, that's a joke, people. But it's serious. Too, right? He says, use the rod of discipline. Right? You, you take that for what it means. That may, that may mean time out in the Hebrew. I don't know. And here's what he... <laughs> What? I'm just telling the truth. Listen, uh, or is there any part of your relationships where you've been saying, God, you've got to move. And he's looking at you and saying, you've got to repent. Anything for you in that? Number two, write this down. I just, these are just two. I'm just, I'm just doing these really quickly. Uh, the second area would be uh, waiting on God to move supernaturally, but he's waiting on you to repent with your finances. Right? It's the new year. You feel the budget crunch. Uh, all the money you spent at Christmas. Some of you got credit card debt up to your eyeballs, right? 
I mean, you had to make the Christmas happen for different family members and other stuff. And maybe Santa didn't help you out as much as he should have this year. And you had to step in and, you know, make it happen. Whatever it is. Listen, I want to tell you. Uh, are you saying, God, you're going to have to move in my finances? But then there's areas you need to repent. Here's what he says. Maybe, maybe he says, God, you've got to move supernaturally. And he says, well, I can. I mean, I own everything. I can give you a raise. I can do that. I can make that happen. I can make your money stretch further, but you need to repent because you're robbing me. You don't ever give anything. You don't give anything to me. You don't give your time. You don't give your finances. You don't give your money. You don't do anything. You just rob from me. You make your life about you. Or maybe you do get, like, maybe you give. Maybe you're a faithful giver and you think, well, that's not my problem. But you say, God, you've got to move. You've got to move in my finances. We just can't make ends meet. And he says, well, listen, uh, it's not about you giving your gift. You do that, man. You're a great giver. You're a fantastic giver, but you squander 90% of what you make. I mean, you look at this is God's, this is mine, and the 90%, you just squander it, man. You waste it on stuff, right? Or he says, you know what, uh, God, you've got to move in my finances or I'm just going to lose it. And God looks at you and he says, what did I say about debt, right? I, I said that a borrower is slave to a lender. But you don't care about debt. You just rack it up, baby. Just cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Just slide that card, man. Your four-year-old knows how to slide a card. Cha-ching, cha-ching. And he's like, you need to repent of having debt in the way that I've said not to. Right? And he says, God, you've got to intervene in my finances. Lord, there's no way I'm not going to make it. And he says, you need to repent of being lazy. I mean, you've got to get out there and find a job. You've got to work. You've got to do anything. Like, you, there's no job below you. You've got to get out there and do it. Right? That's what he says. Listen, God says, I'm fully capable, but you need to repent, right? You've been waiting on me. I've been waiting on you. Here, here's what I love about this story. Did the guy get any of this right? No. Hey, you know what? Jesus was so gracious to him anyway. This guy thought his location would do it. This guy thought his effort would do it. And you know what Jesus did? He said, I'm going to have a moment of grace with this guy. He totally doesn't get it. He totally should be repenting. That should be the thing that unlocks it for him to have supernatural moving in his life. But you know what? I'm not going to wait for that. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give him some grace. I'm going to do it anyway. But then Jesus finds him and says, Hey, the whole reason I did this is so that you repent. Right? Like I reverse ordered it for you. So that you could have more time and so you could see you need to repent. Listen, there's some of you out there and you're like, well, listen, I, I don't follow those things that the Lord has said. But God has still come through, man. My marriage is closer than it's ever been. That's great. You know why? He's giving you grace. But His grace is so that you change. His grace is so that you do repent. He's finding you in the temple today. And He says, you know how your finances keep working out even though you have debt up to your eyeballs? You know how your finances keep working out even though you never give anything to me? You know how your finances work out even though you do give but then you just waste the rest of your money? That's my grace. But it's not so that you keep doing what you want to do. And so that you repent. My, my loving kindness is there so that it gives you longer to wake up and realize what you're doing. That's what happened for this guy. Listen, where do you need to repent today? It could be relationships. It could be finances. It could be a hundred different things. But what's the area that you've been crying out to God? God, you've got to move. I, I can't do this. God, you've got to do it. And my location shows it. My effort shows it. And God looks back at you and just like the guy... That he found at the pool. He says, I'm waiting on you to repent. Let's pray. Today I just want to offer a chance for us to have a corporate repentance. Listen, I've got stuff in my life that I just need to repent of. I've been asking God to help me with this for six months or a year. I've been asking God to help my marriage with this for this amount of time. I've been asking God to help my parenting with this for this amount of time. And God looks at me and He says, I'm totally capable of doing those things. I have all the power and ability to do it. But I've been waiting on you, David. You need to repent of how you handle your anger. You need to repent of this. You need to repent of that. What's the Holy Spirit telling you you need to repent of today? Well, so you've been all this time, maybe, maybe you've wasted 30 years Asking God, God, you got to fix my husband. God, you got to fix my wife. God, you got to fix my marriage. God, you got to fix my finances. God, you got to fix my anger. God, you got to fix my fighting. God, you got to get this. And God looks at you and he says, 
I'm capable, but I'm waiting on you. You need to repent. That means that you change your mind and you agree with God. Right? So what area needs to do that for you? We're just going to open up the front right here. And if we're all honest, if the Holy Spirit moves, and if you're obedient, there should be lots of us up front just repenting and asking God to forgive us. Saying that we're going to follow His way and not our own way. And today, it's not a day for your effort. It's not a day for your location. It's a day for you to say, God, all this time I've been waiting on you. And you've been waiting on me to repent. So today I'm unlocking the door for you to move supernaturally in my life. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would rule and reign over this time. God, I pray that today marriages that have been struggling would, after so long a time, where the steps towards healing would really begin because people, husbands and wives, would repent. God, I pray for people's finances today that they would finally start to come together because, God, we're repenting of how we've misused funds. We're repenting of that. We're repenting of other things. Lord, we're repenting of anger. We're repenting of our mouths. Whatever it is, I pray your Holy Spirit would move. And Lord, you would set people free today. Lord, the joy that this guy felt after you healed him. After you supernaturally moved into his life. It was indescribable. God, I pray that for marriages today. That they would feel that. God, I pray that for wives, for husbands. God, I pray that for single people. Lord, I pray that for people. For their finances. I pray for every area, God. Would you bring healing today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We're just going to stand. If the Holy Spirit spoke to you about something you need to repent of, don't wait. Come right now and you just repent of it.